Well, I think singing was my natural form of expression. And uh, since I was a child, since I can remember, that was the way that I felt the most comfortable expressing myself. And I remember choosing because I was studying piano as well. And I remember the moment that I wanted to choose for singing because I liked having a text. I liked having a story to tell. So that was very important to me. And even as a conductor, it's interesting because I was talking today, this afternoon, to the assistant, um, to the resident conductor, Simon Rivard, at the um, TSO. We were working together on something. And um, I was telling him my story of the Beethoven Egmont Overture, because I'm conducting it this week. And I was saying, yeah, it's like the saraband, you know, the Spanish dance, and had the oppression of the, the low countries with the Spanish dance. You know, this is an overture, right? But, and then I told him the whole story of how it goes, and he said, wow, you made a whole story of it. And I said, yeah, that's, that's how I work. And he said that in his training, he had not been allowed to make stories. He was only allowed to analyze and look at chord progressions, but he wasn't allowed to make stories, and his face was lighting up because... He also wants to work in that way. So it was a very nice uh, moment. You should, you should remember I uh, say that because I, I, I knew Harold Schoenberg when he was music critic of the New York Times. And he said he never forgave Sigmund Spaeth, who was a famous music appreciation teacher in the United States, because he came up with, um, with words to go with the principal melodies of the famous symphonies so people would remember them. And he said, I can't get those words out of yeah. my head. Sometimes that happens when you're rehearsing with an orchestra in the, in the, Stravins in the Stravinsky um, Symphony in Three Movements, there's one line when it goes, da da di da 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 And then I look at the orchestra and I say, oh, Oklahoma, when the... And then they all think of Oklahoma, the musical, when they're playing the Stravinsky Symphony. And so they hate me for that, but... Okay, we, I don't think we've still got to the point of, of, why, of why did I sing to professionalism. Yeah, well, so um, the singing was, as I said, very natural. And I, I think I always knew that I would be a musician. So then the choice was what kind of music. Because I liked musicals, I liked jazz, um, and I liked classical music. So how would I decide? And for me, the clincher was coming to Toronto because I came here before I finished high school. I came here for my last year of high school from Nova Scotia to go to the Etobicoke School of the Arts. And there, I, my teacher in Nova Scotia had written to Mary Morrison, who she'd met at a Nats conference, a Nova Scotia, uh, National Association of Teachers of Singing conference. And she'd written to Mary Morrison to say, could you please listen to this girl and recommend an appropriate teacher for her. And so as soon as I came to Toronto, I was enrolled at the Etobicoke School, which is a high school, and I went to Mary Morrison to sing for her. And at the end of singing for her, she said, I'd like to teach you myself. And that was, I remember going home to my aunts that night. I was staying with my aunt, and I was so excited because I couldn't believe that Mary Morrison was going to teach me. And it was um, a very long uh, partnership and a very one that I cherish very much because she taught me the basis of my technique, which has served me so well. Now I'm 48, then I was 17. And um, once I started with her, I knew that I would continue at U into U of T because I wanted to stay with her. And it was within one or two years at U of T that I became very devoted to contemporary music, and so and so and so. That's how it went. When you started to teach, uh, rather study with her, mm. did she give you an idea of what your potential was? Did she give an idea where you were going? Mm, no, and that's really important question because I love that Mary works with what you are good at doing at the moment. She doesn't project. She doesn't say, in five years, you'll be able to sing Wagner. She just works with what you are good at at this time. And I think it's really good advice for any singer to sing now what you can sing well. Go to an audition and sing what you can sing well now, what they could cast you for now. And then they'll hear, if they're smart on the panel, they'll hear, ah, she can sing this now, and maybe in five years, she'll be able to sing that. 
So it's really, I thought it was, it was great that Mary was always having me sing what I could sing well at the moment. Of course I wanted to sing bigger, more exciting things, but she was so smart and she, she knew that I had a very high musicianship level. And so she encouraged me to use that musicianship towards contemporary music. Um, because it would, f it would feed and stimulate me while my voice was growing, because as I said, I was only 17 years old, and I needed, needed to grow in the instrument. I remember when he was uh, director of the Canadian Opera Company, Lotfi Mansouri reminded me that he was once an operatic tenor, and he said, my voice was ruined by the best of teachers. Hmm. How do you go about finding the right teacher? Well, I was really lucky with Mary, um, because she... You know, how, how many singers are here? Okay, lots. So I'll talk a little, talk a little shop. So because because what Mary does, she has a very forward placement, and she gets you really into a hummy place. And I find that humming um, is the basis for my technique. So if I have ten minutes to warm up. I basically start on a B-flat below middle C, I do an octave hum up, I go all the way down to the bottom of the register, then I start moving up again, closed mouth vocalizing, all the way up to the top, and I hum all the way up to the top. I can hum higher than I can open mouth sing. And then I might do a few staccati, and then I'm good to go. And so she set me up for that. And then it was in 1999, that I started working with another teacher named Neil Seamer. And I'd had a couple of teachers in Europe in between um, who were helpful interpretively, but not technically. And then I started working with Neil Seamer. And at that point, my, my voice was starting to mature a bit more, um, and I needed someone to gui guide me into that next step. And he's an American teacher based in New York, but he teaches all over the place. So he really helped me. And that helped me move into, eventually, the larger roles that I would sing, like Lulu, and to give me the basis and stamina that I was looking for to achieve that. What, to carry on with that, though, um, th there is still that problem of how you find the right teacher for you. Is there any help you can give to uh, the voice to people here? Mm. Well, I think it depends on the way that your, your brain works, because I think every good teacher is saying the same thing, but they're saying it in a different way. So it's also about knowing yourself and how your brain works. And for me, um, I, and it's the same with what I love about different composers, what I love about singing is the combination of the intellectual analytical work with the emotion, and I like it all together at the same time. So when I'm learning music or when I'm preparing a score, it's all those things at one time. I'm analyzing like Simon's teacher encouraged him to do. I'm also looking for the story. I'm also looking for the dramaturgy. And if you look at my score, when I'm preparing a vocal piece, you'll see that I'm marking very specific uh, technical things about passaggio and about vowel color or slight modification or consonants. And then I'm also marking colors or references to films. So it's, it's emotional intellectual for me. And that's why Mary was right for me. And that's why Neil was right for me. But I've also seen um, wonderful singers that don't click with the teachers that I think are fabulous, which is fine. Because as long as they can know themselves and what they want, I think one thing that's very important in a singing teacher is detachment, because it's so personal and so emotional, singing, that it's important to have some distance so that it doesn't become on the verge of therapy. Um, and I, it's true. And I remember when I was watching Neil teach, because um, sometimes in this, I would go to his master classes in the summer, and he'll teach like, 10 hours a day. And at the end of the day, his voice is never tired after all that teaching. And I said, I said, you know, if I teach three hours, I mean, I don't teach that much, but if I teach three hours, you know, give a master class somewhere, I, I'm so emotional and my throat is clenched by the end of the day, I can't even speak. So how do you do it? And he said, oh, you should read a book called Codependent No More. And I said, codependent no more, isn't that a book for drug addicts? Like for families of drug addicts? He said, yeah, but it works for singing. Because, 
Because there's an addictive relationship, because there's this very emotional attachment that we have to our voices. And then when we involve the teacher in it, and then we involve all the projection, and the teacher is projecting their dreams onto you, and so and so and so, it can become very um, complicated. And so I found that really great advice. I read, he said, just read a few chapters. And I read a few chapters and it was great. I never had it again. I never had this clench when I was teaching again because I was able to keep distance. But the other thing about identification, I think that's quite important is to not, I don't actually, it sounds, I'm, I'm not really sure how to put it, but I don't really identify that much with my voice. I'm using the instrument for the things I need to use it for. So I make it do the things that it needs to do, but I don't, I'm not attached to my sound, or like there's a few notes that I like, you know, <laughs> like an A flat, it's a nice note, but I don't think, oh, my voice or my sound or my color. I never think anybody's looking to hear my voice. I only think, how can I make it do what I want it to do to serve that piece of music? That's how I treat it. And maybe it's handy advice for some people. It's, it sounds to me uh, that uh, you're speaking as a musician who happens to use a voice as an instrument rather than somebody who is all about the voice. Well, I'm all about the voice as far as I'm extremely disciplined in the work and I'm very, um, I try to be very precise and very technical about it. But yeah, there's, there's a separation between, I do use it in quite an instrumental way. And then the emotion and the, the playing of the character somehow, for me, feels even stronger because I'm not, I'm not thinking about the high note or even when I'm singing Lulu, it's, it's strange. There's a detachment in it. And Lulu taught me that as well. I mean, she's, she's so cool, you know. <laughs> she's such an amazing person. <laughs> even though she shot her husband. But she, <laughs> she really has this detachment. And so when she pops off all those high notes, a high note, this note, is no more important than that note or that note. They're all just notes, you know? I think Rossini was once asked, what are the three basic requirements of a successful singing career? <laughs> and he said, first, voice, second, voice, third voice. I think you would agree with me that that's not enough today. Uh, well, I think you have to have the instrument. I think you also have to be um, very disciplined. I think discipline is really at the top. You have to want to work hard and you have to enjoy working hard. And I think when you're in school, you know, everybody makes your program for you. Everyone tells you, you have this coaching now, and now you're going to go to this, and now you're going to go to that, and then you're going to learn this, and this is what you're going to... You finish school, and nobody makes your schedule anymore. And, you know, there has to be a kind of discipline in how am I going to plan, how am I... Especially those years before you have an agent, or before you have steady work, before you have a circuit that you're working on. How are you going to be disciplined and how are you going to study and, and develop? And I mean, I make, I like to make really detailed schedules. I mean, really detailed schedules. <laughs> like, <clears throat> you know, the warm up and then exactly what material I'm going to sing for how long, what sections. I don't just walk into the practice room and say, hmm, what am I going to do today? It's very specific. And I schedule in my breaks, and my breaks are not to go on the phone or the computer, but to like take a break or to do memory work. And then I'll work again, and then I'll schedule in exercise so that I'm getting my cardio work, and then I'll go back to do more memory work. It's very, I think discipline is really at the top. I think you have to have an instrument, but you've got to have discipline. Another thing I think you have to have is stamina, because it's, um, all the kind of flying monkey wrenches that happen when the flights go wrong or when uh, rehearsals go late or when everything gets turned topsy-turvy, I think you've got to have a certain, um, maybe resilience is a better word, but that's something that can be developed over time. Resilience, how to, how to be resilient. When you were a young singer just progressing into the profession, 
uh, it's obviously very important to have the right kind of engagements. Uh, and how do you decide what's good for you? And can you say no to people who want you to do something which may be a little premature, but this was the chance, and if you say no, they may not ask you again? It's hard when you're young to say no um, to things that don't suit you. Now, I was in a, what I call a lucky position because I was doing a lot of music that nobody else wanted to do. <laughs> and so I was, I was really in my own little world. And I didn't enter the mainstream until, I mean, I sang, I was prepping Lulu when I was 38, 39. And that, I mean, I was working with mainstream companies, but I was always singing, you know, a lot of world premieres and sometimes Mahler Four, sometimes some Mozart, but it was, it was more outside rap. And then when I sang Lulu, and then Donna Anna, and then Melisande, and then another Lulu production, and then another Melisande production, then I was kind of in the scene. About the no question, it's interesting because you'll be under pressure from several, um, several sides to do something. And I could give you an example of um, the Wozzeck fragments. Now, no one thinks of me as a Marie in Wozzeck, right? But uh, Simon Rattle loves hearing really clean voices sing pieces that he loves. And he and I work together a lot. We worked together last week, in fact. And he wanted me to sing the three Wozzeck fragments, which are for Marie. And I thought, yeah, I, I, yeah, I can sing the fragments. I'm not going to sing the opera, but OK, I'll sing the fragments. And so I sang the fragments with him. And I sang it with a couple of other conductors as well, Yoko Pekka and David Zinman. And every time I did it, I had to recover. Like even just from those fragments, it was like 15 minutes of music. But I had to recover. It was as if something had gotten a little thicker. And Simon wanted me to sing the whole role. And I said yes. And then I said no. I called him up and I said, I can't. I'm wrong. I'm so wrong to think that I can do it. And you know, you know how much I love to work with you, but I cannot. I, it will wreck my voice to sing that role. And it was hard, of course. Now, I was lucky because I'd worked with him enough and we're going to do other things together. But that was, that was maybe, I don't know, eight years ago or something like that. And I don't sing the fragments anymore either because I don't like having to retrain the finesse. It's like the knife edge doesn't stay super sharp if I sing something that's not right for me. For younger singers, you've got the agent, You've got the casting agent, and then you have yourself, and you have your own ego. And it doesn't matter if it's a big house or if it's a small house. If the role isn't right for you, it's not right for you. The problem is sometimes you can sing something quite well, and it's quite exciting, and it feels good, and everyone that's guiding you is saying, you should do this. But they're not thinking of your, they're not all thinking of your long-term health. They might be thinking of, she'll do this really well this year. They're not thinking, what will it do to her and will she be, how will she be next year? Or what other engagements does she have? You know, what other roles does she have? So it's really important, you probably all read Renee Fleming's book, and at one point in Renee's book, she says, she had this polling team that she asked, um, for advice. And some of the people on the polling team, you know, are singing teacher and her friends and family and, and other colleagues and a coach and so on. And it's really important, I think, for everyone to have a polling team that doesn't have um, interests, that let's say that doesn't have a vested interest in you doing that thing that they all want you to do. It's very important to have a kind of team that you can ask for advice that really are just looking out for you. Because, you know, last year I had a really wonderful conversation with a casting director of a major Dutch company, uh, opera company, or the Dutch opera company. And he said, um, he talked about this, he said, we're all complicit. We're all complicit. And, and our egos, we often want to cast someone to do something, and we know 
that it can be damaging to them. But if they say yes, that was their choice. <laughs> that scared me. Yeah, the, the, the opera casting director has to deal with this season, not five or ten years down the road. And he needs a, a particular uh, role to be filled. So among the available options, he will choose and and it won't necessarily be for the singer's best interest. Yeah, and I think another important point is that agents for singers, in the old days, I think they really knew the path of the roles and the development of a voice. And some voices stay more or less the same for a whole career. That's like mine, more or less. I sound like I did when I was 17, except I'm better. But other voices, they do grow and they get bigger you know, around age 27, and then age 35, and then 45, and so they get, they change. And agents, the old school agents, they still know this, but there's not very many left. And so you often have someone that's, your agent is not your career mentor anymore as far as roles go, and that can be tough. Um, not in my case, because I'm, I'm doing all this crazy stuff, and it's, it's a different story, but for a real, a real opera singer, <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I speak. <laughs> for a real opera singer, and you want to follow a trajectory of rules, you've got to have this polling team that's guiding you, because you're probably not going to find it in an agent unless you're really lucky. Uh, how soon do, does a singer find what her voice is and where it should go? Is there a, a general rule? I mean, it's, it's often said that uh, the lower voice singers develop slower and last longer. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's it really depends on each person because it's also a journey that has to do with the, the psychological development as well. I think when someone really comes into their own and takes ownership of the instrument and takes ownership of... of their possibilities and their ex possible expansions. And um, I mean, certainly lighter voices are ready sooner. They're ready to get out there. And it's, I think that's also why, you know, the age limit for men in competitions is 35 and for women it's 32. It's partly because of that. But I, I, it's a hard question to answer because I think it's so different for everyone. And and I think a young singer can mean so many different things, you know. I once had a conversation with Beverly Sills in which she said, I had a choice. Either I could have a long, boring career or a shorter, exciting career. And I chose the second option. Do you see the, her point? Well, but she, I mean, her career also involved running city opera. You know, if she meant the career only as a singer, but she had such an exciting career for her entire career. I mean, she was on the Danny Kaye show. <laughs> There's a great clip on YouTube of them doing a, I think it's a Brooklyn accent or something and singing. But I mean, yeah, I'm happy to still be singing at, at 48 and still be, you know, doing the roles that I want to do and enjoying it and working with the conductors and directors that I love to work with. Um, I think a lot of singers leave the business earlier, not necessarily for vocal reasons. I think a lot of singers leave earlier and take a, a different route, whatever that may be, if it's teaching younger colleagues or whatever, um, because there are aspects of it that are unpleasant and you have to learn how to deal with it and somehow to embrace it because the unpleasant things are tough. Uh, the travel, if you're, if you're a freelancer, the travel, being away all the time, um, it, it's lonely and it can feel isolating and if you don't have a way to cope with that, if you don't have coping mechanisms, I think I've met a lot of singers who are cynical or who are, um, they feel kind of used and that's sad to see because a lot of, I think a lot of voices are just coming into their prime, you know, around f early 40s and into the early 50s, and that's the time when a lot of singers leave the scene because they're just tired of it. I've noticed that uh, a lot of companies in Canada and the United States now, a lot of opera companies also perform musical comedy, 
Uh, in fact, the Glimmer Glass Opera Festival in Cooperstown is no longer the Glimmer Glass Opera Festival. It's the Glimmer Glass Festival because one of his four productions each year is a classic musical. Right. I'm wondering if that affects the kind of training singers have to have to have today. If you're going to be an opera singer, are you also going to be a musical comedy singer? Um, well, I don't, you know, I've been in Europe for the last 25 years, so I don't see so much um, of the musicals over there, although English National Opera does Candide, and I mean, I'm, I love musicals, so. If I got offered a musical, I would do it. Glitter and Begay is not a musical comedy. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not. But, um, I mean, I think one has to use the same technique for everything that one does. And so I don't think that it's a different skill set now as opposed to earlier. I think a, a, a focused and disciplined technique that that is, you know, um, built to have a long, long career is the way to go. I don't really see any other way about it. And whatever you sing, you have to sing with your best technique, whether it's modern music or whether it's a musical or whether it's traditional grand opera. I think it's all the same. For me, it's the same. It's often said that conducting is something you learn how to do by doing. Um, but did you also uh, involve yourself with, with studying with any particular conductors? Yeah, I mean, it's true. You, you kind of have to learn it by doing. That's, that's for sure. But I did, um, I think it was after the second year, or after the first year of conducting or second year, I was doing this concert in Berlin with um, Simon Rattle, and we were doing Facade by William Walton. And it's just seven instrumentalists and speaker. And so... Simon and I would trade off with the speaking. So he would speak and I would conduct the ensemble while he spoke and then I would speak and he would conduct. So we were like tag team and it was very funny. And then the next day um, I was at the airport in Berlin heading back to wherever or heading wherever I was going and I called him to thank him. And he said, you know, you really should take some conducting lessons. I was like, okay. He said, because I think you're going to end up doing this for a long time. And so he called up Yorma Panula, you know, the Finnish teacher that taught Yukapeka and Asapeka, all the Finns. And he called up Yorma and said, um, I want you to teach this woman. And so I went to Yorma for a year and a half and I took private lessons with him. We would work with a pianist and that was really helpful. And the plan for Simon was that once I kind of got to a certain level, then he would help me. So then I would do the same thing with Simon. We'd work with a pianist and he'd coach me on some stuff. And meanwhile, I was gigging, you know, I was conducting orchestras and so on. So I was, and that's kind of the best way to do it. And I also did some study with David Zinman, who was just wonderful. And it's all, it's different with each person. And um, and in the end, you take everything that you've learned and you have to figure out how your own body works and how that, how that is best for you. I mean, my motor, motoric or whatever it is in physical movement skill, whatever, I don't know the word, um, is very particular and I use it in a similar way to the way I use my body as a singer. And as when I sing certain roles, I use my body in a certain way. And so I do the same. And as long as the orchestra understands what I want, which I think they do, then it's effective. It used to be said that Toscanini screamed at his orchestra to sing, sing. <laughs> do you think your background as a singer informs your work as a conductor? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And the, the breathing and the spaciousness that I'm looking for and the line that I'm looking for. And I often, the easiest thing most of the time is to just demonstrate to the orchestra what you want by singing it to them. And most conductors do the same thing, but their voice is, is not as good as mine. And so, <laughs> but the orchestra, they always laugh whenever I, especially the violins, you know, when I sing their line in their register, they're always laughing. But to just show the kind of articulation that you want and the kind of elasticity or the color that you want, of course you use the instrument to demonstrate and it's very helpful. And also, I mean, in the, in the parts it says cantare or cantabile or there's so many vocal terms in the music. Um, and I think also 
the breathing is so is so important. And when I worked with when I work with Simon, he's in the front of my mind because we just did this wonderful piece last week that I love so much. And I don't have to look at him. In fact, he has to look at me because he says, I, just, I can just look at you out of the corner of my eye and you always show me how you're about to sing the next phrase. You show me with the way that you breathe how you're going to sing the next phrase. And he said, apply that to your conducting. So then I show the orchestra because I'm breathing with them as a conductor, I'm breathing with them and I show them how I want, what kind of time I want before the next phrase, you know? And that's, you know, that's something that is very, very helpful for them. I notice you've been recently appointed a, a principal guest conductor of the Gothenburg Symphony in Sweden, one of the major Swedish orchestras. How, how are you going to approach that job? Do you have a choice of repertoire and what sort of things do you want to do with that orchestra? Yeah, um, well, I've been working with that orchestra maybe six years or something and um, like, you know, one week a year and so on. And then, and then I was um, artist in residence for a year, so then it was four weeks in that year. And um, they're a very happy orchestra. They're really, they're a wonderful group and wonderful musicians. And we did the Rake's Progress last year, actually. Um, I always choose my repertoire. I'm very fortunate. No, no orchestra ever comes to me and says, will you conduct this piece? It never goes like that. It's always, will you come? What would you like to do? And so I make my programs very particularly. Um, there is, for me, always a kind of dramaturgical theme that makes sense to me. And I don't even need to explain it to everyone, I, but it, for me, it makes sense. Um, this year, with them, I'm doing the Mozart Requiem with the Berg Violin Concerto. So two requiems, because the Berg Violin Concerto is also a requiem. And um, I'll be there in 10 days or so, or something like that. And we'll be doing um, Verklärte Nacht of Schoenberg. And it was, it's nice when you know an orchestra because, you know, I can call up the concertmaster and say, how many strings do you think we should have? What's the possibility? What's your opinion of this? You know, to really be in dialogue with them. And so I wouldn't have taken that position with them if I didn't feel that we really could be in dialogue because I like to collaborate with the people I'm working with. So for me, the, the orchestras that I have regular relationships are very important. And... Munich Philharmonic is the other one. I'm there three weeks a year, every year. And Gothenburg Symphony. Not bad for a, Not too a bad. young conductor, eh? A young conductor, but an old singer. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, to, to carry on with that idea of, uh, of you uh, as a singer being a conductor as well, um, has this leaned you to a particular repertoire? What sort of taste do you have as a conductor? I love Haydn. Haydn is my boyfriend. Bless you. He is so, I mean, his symphonies are just so fantastic. And the funny thing is, his vocal writing, not so great. But his symphonies, amazing. So I, got, I get to dig into all this. Um, I mean, how many did he write? A hundred and... <laughs> so... I get to dig into Haydn, you know. This year I'm doing three different symphonies of Haydn. This week I'll do uh, 96. I heard an orchestra player recently say, Mozart wrote 41 symphonies and about 15 of them are good. Haydn wrote 104 and they're all good. They're all good. They're so great. And for me, what's really exciting is that I have my own parts, you know. So what happens when I do a Haydn symphony is I order my own set of parts and score. This is, some, some people do this. And then I make all my own bowings. That means I decide when the violins go up and down, basically, and all the articulation. I plan everything. I mark every single part exactly how I want it. I send it to my copyist, and then they send my parts to the orchestra. So, because you have to be very particular, because if you don't, and you just put the music in front of them for a Haydn symphony, like, you know, there's 104 or two, or whatever it is, it, it's a free-for-all, you know? Stylistically, it's also a free-for-all. So you have to be very, very clear and specific. So for, 
for pieces like that, like Haydn Symphony, and also for the Mozart Requiem, I have my own set of parts. I have my own set of marked parts for the choir as well, for the Mozart Requiem. And anyway, I'm going to go on about it. But um, one of the things I love is getting to explore repertoire that I maybe would not, or composers that I wouldn't have explored as a singer. So that's very exciting. And for me, it's not a matter of time period, not at all. Like I, I said, the Berg Violin Concerto with the Mozart Requiem, dramaturgically, it makes perfect sense to me. Um, and this season, my heart just started beating faster because I'm going to conduct Mahler IV for the first time, and I'm going to sing it as well. You're going to sing Mahler IV while conducting? Well, the fourth movement is the easiest movement for the orchestra. I mean, it's pretty easy for them. And I'm doing it with Munich Phil, and I think they premiered it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm super excited and scared to death, but it's not until May. But, you know, that's a piece that's going to be, I mean, it's so exciting to start preparing that score in that way. I mean, I used to just sit there. Yeah. You know, I used to just be like that. <laughs> After 35 minutes, I'd get up and say, Wir genießen die himmlischen Freuden. And now, I don't sit there for 35 minutes. I'll be busy. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I would advise other sopranos to follow your course. But none to of each that. his own. Uh, the, um, the idea of, of, um, of, uh, of conducting Haydn it seems like it's such a healthy one. And the idea also of your bringing your marked parts. Yeah. I don't know if you remember, there was a conductor a couple of generations ago who specialized in pops concerts. His name was Andre Castellanitz. Oh, yeah. And he used to carry, because he knew pops concerts had very yeah. little rehearsal. No, no, no. So he always carried a yeah. complete set of marked parts so he didn't waste all that time in rehearsal. Yeah. And a lot of time in rehearsal is made marking parts, correcting parts. Yeah, yeah. and there's no time for it. There, there's really no time. I mean, we put, we're putting a, the Toronto Symphony program together with two days of rehearsal. That's it, tomorrow and the next day. And then we have a dress rehearsal and that's it. And we're doing a huge program. So you have to be really prepared and disciplined and organized and, you know, and you have to enjoy doing that. And it's fun. You seem to be moving more and more in the direction of conducting. Are you easing off singing deliberately? Well, this season, no, uh, and next season, no, and the season after that, no. So, no. <laughs> no. So much for that idea. Yeah. No, this season's pretty, pretty opera-heavy. I have two different Lulu um, productions, one in Hamburg and Cleveland Orchestra, and um, a world premiere opera at the Munich Staatsoper, The Snow Queen by Hans Abrahamson. So it's pretty opera heavy um, this year. Um, so no, I'm not really easing off, but there are certain there are certain pieces that sometimes I step away from just because I'd like other people to sing it. Like the, the piece I sang last week, this Abrahamson piece, which we did with Toronto Symphony, I sang it 37 times in five years. And so I made a post on, on the Facebook and said, I decided that I wasn't going to sing it anymore because I want other singers to sing it. And I started writing emails to other sopranos who I admire, saying, I've told the publisher to send you this score. It's perfect for you. I'm so excited if you would, you know, take it on because you would bring so much to it. And, and to tell them that I'm not singing it anymore because I think if a piece is so associated with one person, perhaps the other singers wouldn't memorize it because they would think, oh, I'll never be first call. So I'm trying to get other people to be first call for some of the pieces that I really love um, to help those pieces have a, a, a long life. I noticed that uh, you're, you've chosen your roles over the years with a lot of thought, and that's something that uh, is commendable. I'm wondering if there are some roles still ahead of you that you have been working toward that you would like to sing, or whether you just approach each opportunity as it comes. A role for me, it always depends on who's directing and who's conducting. So I... When I, I never thought, oh, La Voix You Men is a piece I'd really love to sing. But when Varlikovsky wanted to do it with me, with Esapeka conducting, then I thought, La Voix Man is a part I really want to sing. 
and we did something really special with it. The same thing happened with Melisande. It was with Katie Mitchell and Asapeka, and then later it was with Varlikovsky and Sylvain Cambrelin. So those were two situations where I thought, yes, I really want to explore this music and this character with these people. Um, I had a wish list, and most of the things I either did or I crossed off that I wasn't interested in anymore. I will sing Erwartung, um, and it's, it's an interesting choice to do it. Um, it's with Simon, and he feels that any singer that sings Erwartung should be slightly amplified. And that makes a huge difference because Simon likes the orchestra to be able to really play, and I know this. So it's great that I'll be slightly amplified because then I don't have to push because it sits quite low, but it's a role I really want to play. And I'm going to do it with two different directors. Once with Simon, with Nisha Jones, who's a really interesting British director, and then I'll do it at a big German company with Varlikovsky. So that's going to be great because I love working with him. I remember a few years ago, uh, I went to the Aix-en-Provence Festival in the south of France to hear you do uh, Mélisande in yeah. Pelias. That was my Mélisande. first Mélisande, yeah. And uh, on, on that occasion, I, I, I came back and wrote about it, and then I ran into the composer John Beckwith on the street, oh, yeah. who had been, of course, at the, uh, the, the University of Toronto Faculty of Music when you were there. And, uh, and uh, I, I said I, how surprised I was that you had sung it. And he said, I'm not surprised. She can <laughs> sing anything. So uh, was that your, uh, one of your goals, to be able to be that versatile, that you can virtually take the score, providing it fitted your vocal range, uh, and tackle it? Well, I think Melisand is a very particular role because, in a way, anybody can sing Melisand. Any woman can sing Melisand. And, really? Yeah, really, because you can have a mezzo or you can have a soprano. You can have a light voice and you can have a heavy, have a heavy voice. That's why I mean any voice can sing it. But there's a certain character to Melisande, which is why casting wants a certain person for it. It's, Melisande is not about the voice. It's about the acting, and I think it always has been, from Mary Garden to Georgette Leblanc to Maggie Tate, the original performers of it, it's much more about the, the acting of this person who basically, the guys go on and on and on for page after page and page of music, and she says, no, <laughs> or je ne sais pas. <laughs> and, so, and so there's something else that you have to be able to have. And that's why that relationship with the director is so important, because that's the reason that I did those productions. That was Katie Mitchell, I think. That was Katie uh, Mitchell in You have a special rapport with her, and why? Because um, Katie and I uh, first worked together on Written on Skin, the George Benjamin opera. Then we worked on the Peleas. Then we, worked, we did the new George Benjamin opera, Lessons in Love and Violence. I think she's a brilliant director. Um, she has a very interesting um, vision. She tells the story of a piece. You know, we were talking backstage. I like directors that tell the story of the piece. I don't like when they impose an extra story on top. I like when they tell the story of the piece. I don't mind if they move the time setting or if it's timeless or whatever, but it needs to be the right story. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I wanted to explore that role with Katie. And it was interesting because she did add one, um, one extra thing to it, and that is that she wanted it to be Melisande's dream. So she wanted the opera to be a kind of a dream, which made sense because it's so weird that it is a dream in a way. And so we were always working from that perspective. And I have to say, I was so lucky in that production because everyone in the production had sung their roles before. I was the only newbie. I, I mean, it was a new production, but I mean, they'd all sung countless Peleases and countless Golo and Genevieve and Ignold. And I was singing my first Melisande. And my colleagues, they were so amazing and they helped me so much. And they were all French. I was the only English person. And Stéphane Degout, it was his last Peleas, and he, he's, he sang that role so many times, and he, 
he was such an incredible colleague. And I remember in the scene just before he gets killed by Golo, we were standing there in, the, our, in our love scene in our underwear. And I was standing behind him and I was holding him and his body was shaking because it's so demanding for him to sing. And I was standing there and I thought, what an incredible privilege like to, to be able to, to hold this body, this artist, while he's singing his last Peleas. It was just unforgettable. So intimate, you know. And then the show's over and you go home. You know, it's just amazing memory. Well, you, you had a very ex a special experience, obviously, with that production. But I wonder how, how, how you deal as a singer with directors. Um, they are a very special breed and they can be very strange. <laughs> and you have to protect your voice and the, the, at the same time you have to project the character that you believe in. How does it work? I offer a lot. Um, I don't work with very many directors that kind of tell you where to go and what to do. Katie does that a little bit. She often has an idea already in her head. Um, but with Varlikovsky or Krzysztof Martal or Kriegenberg, these are all three directors who I love a lot. Um, you offer a lot of material. Um, I come in, I usually finish rehearsal and then I go home and then I'm thinking and watching YouTube and looking for images and inspiration, all kinds of things, so that the next day I know what scene we're going to do and I've got something already to offer. And so that we're building, we're co in constant collaboration. I never walk in without an idea of what I want to do. And I think, I th I'm very particular about it and I have never had a conflict, I mean, not in recent years, with a director. I haven't had a conflict. If, if, we, if we disagree on something, it's not even a disagreement. It's just a negotiation. You're very lucky. I was once <laughs> in, in Leipzig for a performance at the Barber of Seville in which all the characters were portrayed as insects. Okay. <laughs> I asked one of the singers, um, how do you feel about this? And she said... We hated it, <laughs> but we wanted the work, yeah. so we did it. Mm. The director said he heard the sound of insects in Rossini's music. <laughs> How do you protect yourself from that? <laughs> well, there he is in the overtures. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, uh, how did I protect myself? Well, there is a psychology, like, and I think it's something that you have to develop as a, as a young artist. Like, you know, I said negotiation, but there's a kind of... There's a way of, of communicating. There's a really great book by Marshall Rosenberg called Nonviolent Communication. It's about dealing with terrorists, but it's helpful for singers. And, <laughs> and it's because you, you learn how to use non-aggressive language, you know, so that you don't, because there is high tension in the rehearsal room. There's high tension and there's sometimes there's big egos and sometimes egos have to do with fear and doubt and blah, blah, blah. And so, how do you how do you communicate and keep things in a flow and not in a push pull? You know, it's like Tai Chi. You know, how do you keep things in a flow with each other? And and you're manipulating energy, manipulate meaning just in a good way, in the hand, you know, keeping it in hand. And so I think those skills are very important to develop and to use your psychology. I remember when I was doing an opera by Hosokawa. There are two interesting things about that. One was that Toshio Hosokawa had written this opera called Matsukaze, I was doing with him. I thought my part was kind of boring. And I was like, no high notes, it's pretty well all on one note, which is a B flat. It was like, not a high one, just. A da, 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 da. Was, and so I, I needed to convince Toshio that we were going to be changing some stuff. And I realized he didn't like to sit face to face because he was so shy. And so I put the score on the floor, and we knelt down side by side, and we looked at the score. And already, that was the right way to talk to him. And then, um, little by little, I, I said, Can I, how would you feel if I tried this, or if I went like that, or da-da-da. And 
so we made the part together into something that we both loved. And the other thing about that production, which was interesting, was we did it with several different conductors. And with one of the conductors, um, he something wasn't right about the tempo or something. And the woman that played my sister in the opera, she said, oh, can you ask him to do it differently? And I said, but why don't you ask him? And she goes, because whenever you ask for something, you get it. <laughs> and, but I knew what she meant, because she, she, off, she would often ask with a hard edge. And she, so she would confront with a hard edge, she, she would be met with a hard edge. And if she could ask, if she could find a way to ask or to open up a conversation that had flexibility, elastic feeling to it, then you have much more creative flow in the space and collaboration. And I mean, the rehearsal room is such a sacred place. And I like when there's mystery in the room. And I like when things go wrong and we try things and they don't work. And sometimes, things go too far in one direction, and sometimes I push my voice too far, or I, I, I push my body too far so I can't sing. But I think I prefer a space that has that than a space where everything is, is this okay, or is it controlled, or it's all planned in advance. I much prefer when it's free. And so I am, like you said, I am lucky because but I also actively try to create those situations. And I also, and I'm saying this because for the, the singers here, I think it's also possible to change the climate of your rehearsal room. It's possible to change the temperature and the energy of the room by your energy. Even if you have a small part, you can change it. I mean, you really can influence the, the energy of a room um, with a certain, Commitment and that commitment can be, for example, don't sit down in the sits proba, stand up all the time. Doesn't matter if everybody else is sitting down. I mean, people sit like this, they want to show that they're not nervous. We're all nervous. Put your stand up and sing. When you're standing in front of an orchestra and singing an orchestra concert, uh, rehearsals, don't let them give you a chair. Turn the music stand around so you're facing the orchestra. You know, all these things. They change the temperature of the room. Pay attention when the conductor is talking to the bassoon player. Like, pay attention when the conductor is talking to the horns or the tuba. Mark it in, in your score. Use a full score, not a piano score. Like, all these things change the feeling of a workspace, and everyone else will perk up. If you, because you're a leader, you know, even if you have a small part, you're a leader. So. Be involved in those things, participate in those things, and everything starts to change. Could you talk a little bit about working with conductors? Um, I once asked a member of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra what, what he regarded as the role of the conductor, and he said, to not get in the way. That's true. That's, that's true. You don't want to get in the way. You want to get out of the way when they don't need you, and when they need you, you want to be there to just for transitions. Color. I mean, most of the work that you do with them is done in the rehearsal room, in the rehearsal time. And the, the, sh the, the performance, often, a lot of the things that you do as conductor is to help the audience see also what they should be listening to. That's, I like that. I, I remember when one of my co conductor colleagues told me that, and I thought, yeah, like, we all know you didn't need to give this person the cue. It's so that the audience knows this is where the main voice is, you know? Yeah, working with conductors, I enjoy it. I, I've worked with wonderful conductors, and I've learned a lot from all of them, even the ones that aren't so great, because you can learn a lot when something doesn't work. And um, Have there been any particular ones that have inspired you in a particular way as a future conductor and as a present conductor? Well, yes. I would say um, Kirill Petrenko and Vladimir Jarovsky as opera conductors. And there's... The biggest reason for that is because they were there. Now, what do I mean by that? An opera production is six weeks of rehearsal. What happens most of the time is that the conductor comes for a grand total of about two and a half. And it's really a drag, because they're not in the room with you. You're building all of this material. You're building this whole production, and the conductor is not there. Why? Partly because they're 
doing other performances in other places, or they may be on vacation, or they may be prepping. Um, but I feel that it's doing a disservice to opera productions when the conductor is not present for, let's say, two-thirds of the time at minimum. Otherwise, we have assistants, um, and then the conductor comes in at the last minute, has no idea where anyone is on stage, doesn't understand the, the feeling that we've created about what story are we telling of this piece, and it creates um, even more hierarchy between the conductor and the rest of the people in the room. So Vlad Jarovsky is always there. Kirill Petrenko, the, we did Hamlet together, uh, Vlad and I, at Glyndebourne. Every single day he was in rehearsal. And he was marking his score and watching us do the staging. Sometimes he didn't conduct for an hour and a half. And he'd just be quietly marked. He'd look up when there was something, some discussion he thought maybe he should be part of. He always had his antenna on. And he was there all the time except when he was rehearsing the orchestra. Same thing with Kirill Petrenko at Staatsoper in Munich when we did the um, uh, Die Soldaten by Zimmermann. I mean, crazy piece. The only times that he wasn't there was when, his, when he was conducting the orchestra and his wonderful assistant, Oksana Livnev, was conducting our rehearsals. And those were two of the best productions I've ever done because everyone was present. Uh, I envy you. Uh, most of us in North America haven't heard Kirill Petrenko, and he's now conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic, arguably one of the great orchestras of the world. And, uh, and he never gives interviews. He's in, interested in no publicity. So we're all puzzled about the mystery of what makes this man special. Well, one of the things that makes him special is that we did Diesel Dotten, uh, we did five performances in spring and then another three the following autumn. Every single performance at the intermission, we were in his dressing room rehearsing material for the second half of the opera. In every single performance, we rehearsed at intermission. So we'd just down a quick couple of coffee, change our clothes, and run to his room to rehearse. And I think before every performance, we also rehearsed certain aspects because it was so difficult. And we were, we loved it. I mean, we were there, you know, because he was there. It was fabulous. I, I was like, I love rehearsing at intermission, you know? It was, it was an amazing, it was such a team spirit, you know, that everyone was working so hard. Many years ago, uh before there was an opera company in Hamilton, and then once again, there is no longer an opera company in Hamilton. Anyway, they had Fest Italia, and they brought over an opera company from Catania in Sicily. Oh. And I remember a production of, uh, uh, in which they did uh, uh, Pagliacci, and, uh, they, uh, and, and did it with Cavalieri Aristocan, of course, the ham and eggs. And they were rehearsing in, in uh, intermission for the next act. Yeah. And the reason we were doing that was that was the only rehearsal they had. <laughs> okay. That's changed. <laughs> yeah, that's changed. But you know what you said at the very beginning about um, Domingo prepping, you know, that, that was very good advice I got from Don Tarnowski, actually, who's a co coach here in town many years ago. Um, he said, make sure that you're always prepping the next thing while you're performing what you're doing now. And that was very good because that's absolutely true. That's how it is. And you have to have that discipline. And performance day is not kind of laying around in bed eating chocolates. <laughs> you're up and you're, you're prepping the next thing and you're studying something else and, you know, really working hard. And I think it's, you know, it's fun to work. It's really fun because you love it and you're passionate about it. And that's, I mean, being a musician is really such an incredible opportunity. And so it's a joyous, a joyous way to work. Well, I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. So think about some questions you'd like to ask. And in the meantime, I want to ask Barbara Hannigan about a project that she's taken up recently called Equilibrium Young Artists. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so uh, I started Equilibrium uh, two years ago. I started a, a mentoring initiative for young artists because I felt that the first seven or eight years as a professional are really tough. And we lose a lot of, not just singers, we lose a lot of people that have worked for any career, doctors or, or business people or whatever. We, they don't make it through those first seven or eight years very well and they leave and go on to something else. And, so 
I felt that instead, I mean, I wanted to use, let's say, the, the power or the influence, power and influence, that I had accumulated over all my years and to try and help my younger colleagues. And so I created Equilibrium and I wanted to engage the orchestras that I had relationships with to work with these younger professional artists. Um, so I asked them and they said yes. And so we did the Rake's Progress 15 times this year with Munich Philharmonic and Gothenburg Symphony. We had a documentary film made on us, the DVD of the whole opera. We did the Mozart Requiem with Danish Radio S Symphony Orchestra and also Munich Philharmonic and the Pul complete Pulcinella of Stravinsky. And so I had 350 applications from 39 countries and I took 20 singers, about 20, 21 singers. And we have performances, but another big part of our work is that we have workshops. And we work um, with an Olympic coach on mental discipline, uh, somebody I've known for about 10 years. And she comes from the tennis world, but she coaches archers, swimmers, field hockey, Olympic medalists, and team and individual. So she works with the singers on kind of laser focus and mindset. Tai Chi, yoga, more normal for singers. And we had guests coming in and talking, kind of like I'm talking today, but we had, we sit in a circle because there's only 10 of us at a time, 15 at a time max. Daniel Harding, Natalie Desai, casting directors, heads of CD labels, whatever, um, talking about their path and sharing their experience and also their perspective on our careers. Casper Holton from the Royal Opera House, composers and so on. And it's been really, it's been really amazing um, to, to be able to help my, my younger colleagues and to, to work with them. And, and now it's kind of my third career because I didn't even have time for the two things I already had and now I have three. But when you're passionate about something, you love it and you do it. And so that's how it goes. And so, um, yeah, long live equilibrium. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, the, the, uh, the floor is now open, unfortunately. Uh, oh, you, if you got, can that? I'm just going to facilitate questions can come to this microphone. That way you're heard. We have to walk up. Approach. <laughs> you may approach. <laughs> My name is Amanda Vallejos, and I'm a lyric soprano, older beginner. And I guess one of my questions is, I approach my music in a similar way to you in, from an intellectual standpoint, but I don't seem to be able to put the emotional side on it as efficiently. I feel like I'm rather stiff in my performances. How would you recommend I go about moving beyond that intellectual end? And it happens only in performance, not in the rehearsal room? I would say both. And what about in the practice room? No. So in practice room, you're free? Yeah. Hmm, interesting. So there's something about being in public yeah. that, that inhibits the emotional thing. Mm -hmm. hmm. Not when I'm speaking in public. Yeah. I feel fine. Right. But the second you're I start to sing, there's that <sighs> veil. But, you know, in a way, it's perfectly natural because singing is such a, I mean, you are so vulnerable. When, when a person sings, you are connected to the most primal, vital thing of who you are. So, of course, anyone would be inhibited. And I think it is a gradual opening. I mean, I would say maybe set three reasonable goals okay. this, and, um, for a rehearsal situation. Set three reasonable goals. Think, like, think, okay, what did I do in the practice room that I want to be able to translate into the rehearsal room? Set three things that you want to do in that rehearsal for that day. Write them down on a piece of paper or in an envelope and keep opening the envelope all through the rehearsal. These are like sport techniques, right? Mm -hmm. But they work. And keep opening the envelope, keep reading it, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. If you achieve one, fabulous. And I think, you know, step by step by step, that, that could happen. But... In fact, you would not be normal if you didn't have that inhibition right. because it is very, um, 
a very fragile, vulnerable situation to be in. So first, already to accept that's okay. That is normal, in fact. And so gradually to open, to open, to open. And all that body awareness, like, you know, to analyze where, where does the tension feel different in the rehearsal room than it feels in the practice room? Because the good thing is you've got it in the practice room. Mm -hmm. So you have it, you just have to translate it. So it's that constant analysis, you know, like, oh, okay, where am I? Am I holding in the hip? Or is my throat clenching? Is the tongue pulling back? Is it that my, my, my body caves in? Am I able to stay expanded? You know, all those things. And if you are analytical like that, then you, it, it could be actually quite fun to try and figure out like a detective. It's like a, an experiment, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like a detective, yeah. like all the little things, one by one. So setting those reasonable goals and if you can get one, then the next, then the next for each rehearsal, I think that would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, John Jilks, I'm a writer. Um, you've probably helped create more new operas than anybody else I can think of. What makes you decide to get involved in a project? Yeah. Or equally, what makes you decide not, not to get to. involved in yeah, the, the way I get involved in, um, if it's, well, first of all, if it's a normal opera, it's the director, the conductor. The house doesn't mean so much to me. It's more that team. And I also, I'm very picky about who I'm singing with, so I check who's the cast list and do I want to work with this group of people, etc. I'm quite, you know, it's a luxury position now, but I was always a bit like that. Um, and then with the world premieres, it's... Um, how do I choose the composer? It's the voice. It's never a particular style for a composer. If you look at the composers that I've worked with, there's no rhyme or reason as to why it was, you know, stylistically, you couldn't say it was new complexity or serialism or minimalism or this ism or that ism. It's, for me, it's the composer's voice. Do they have, again, it's that combination of intellectual, emotional intensity in a very honest way. And I can feel that honesty just by looking at the page. And I can feel it when I hear their music. And do I want to, to be the voice for that with them? So it's, it's, that, it's a lot of gut feelings, but it has to do with preparation and research. How are you? I'm going to see you soon. Yes. Yeah. Um, my name is Maeve Palmer. Um, I was just wondering what a typical day looks like for you, um, particularly when you don't have a rehearsal. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what's a, that's good. Because um, a working day for me, um, if it's a working day, let's say, um, I, I get up, I, I hydrate, I eat breakfast, I don't check, don't check my voice. A lot of singers wake up in the morning and they're lying in bed and they go, mmm, I don't do that. You've By been the way, uh, uh, one of your colleagues, uh, <laughs> mezzo-soprano Catherine Robin once told yeah, me. Yeah, the little bird she thing. She gets up in the morning and look, little goes bird, to the bathroom, looks in the mirror and says, hello, little bird, are you there? Okay, I don't do that. Um, <laughs> and, then, like, I, I make a really detailed schedule of what I have to get done. I like to do my singing work early in the day before I've had anything else freak me out. Um, like, so the vo anything, if I have to do urgent administration, administrative work, I will, emails or whatever. Otherwise, it's straight into the singing. Um, I'm even, I even plan the warm-up, so it's usually humming staccato, and if I have time, it's humming staccato, nine-note scales, mezza di voce, right, crescendo di crescendo, um, some fioratura, like, I'll go to town with the technique if I have time. Then um, I decide very specifically what material I want to be practicing, um, and I stick to it. Um, and I make it, like I said, a specific schedule also for when I'm resting. Um, I make sure that I do cardio and exercise work every day if I, if I have time, like go for a run, um, mild weights. Um, I don't do classes or anything, and I don't take yoga and tai chi, but I do it on my when I do my workshops with the young'uns. And um, 
I'm quite specific also about what I eat and when. And this is maybe more to do with performance days, but performance days is very strict. I always stay in Airbnbs. I don't stay in hotels. I cook my own food. I control my, my diet. Um, you know, it's pretty boring when I'm working. Um, and I eat three hours before performance and then a snack one and a half hours before or one hour before. And if it's uh, Lulu, then I have more food in the dressing room, like uh, apples and maybe half a banana midway through for the one or two intermissions. Um, and then at the end of the day, that's when I do the boring stuff, you know, open the mail or uh, emails, administrative things. That's for the end of the day because I want to keep the creative space really clean in the morning so that I'm in my most connective, um, trying to see you there, so that I'm in my most connective, like I can make the most connections. So that's when I'm most fresh. I used to work three session days and I don't do that so often anymore because I found it was tiring me for some reason. And so I try to only work two sessions a day and then allow myself to have either the afternoon or the evening off. Usually it's the evening off. And um, yeah, I plan quite far in advance. Like I start studying rep, you know, quite early in advance. Oh, and one great hint, I think I told you this, Maeve, before. Always start with the end of the piece. Learn the end first, because then you're always walking, working towards something you know. Um, conductor told me that. It was great advice. And, um, and the other thing about learning music, I think is quite important for any style, not just contemporary music for any style, is um, it's not necessary to learn music with your voice, right? So you, you should kind of have figured out the piece visually before you even attempt to start singing it. And normally when I start singing anything, I usually do it like on the bubble or humming or, but I've already figured out the lay of the, of the piece. You know, I've already figured it all out before I start singing it. I don't use the voice to try things out. That's wasteful. So that's how I, um, I recommend for health. I mean, we need to develop stamina and so on and resilience in the instrument, but we also don't want to tire it out. It's like running a cross-country running course and you didn't know where it was going to go. You know, you, you, if you're going to run cross-country, you check the course first and then you know what you're going to do. So I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so... Oh, yes, the question from the young composer. Yes. Bill, you have it. Is he here? Um, we left. Uh, well, we're not going to answer it if he left. It's, it's a young voice, obviously. What advice would you give to young composers in grade school? It was so sweet. Actually, I would say go to a lot of concerts. But I would say that to everyone. Go hear concerts. Go to live concerts. Listen to what's out there, all kinds of music, all kinds of music, all different styles. And I would highly suggest that. And he asks a second question. What do you think, he doesn't ask small questions, what do you think is the future of classical music as a genre? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the future of anything, but... I love it where it is right now anyway. Well, you're obviously in the position of making that future happen. Um, it's uh, many years ago that one of my favorite musicologists, um, Anna Russell, oh, yeah. once said <laughs> of singers, they've got resonance where their brains ought to be. Well, I think this afternoon we've discovered it's possible to have both. <laughs> Barbara Hannigan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you so much to Anne for inviting me. She's, you're wonderful and persistent, and I'm happy I came. Thank you. <laughs> I get to I get to do the advertising at the end. Um, so thank you, Barbara.
honest and real and insightful. Thank you so much. And who expected to know about books on addiction and terrorism? <laughs> Thank you, William. Another lovely conversation and dropping all of those really interesting names. And thank you to the crew and volunteers and to all of you online and in person for taking care. Our next encounter and concert for singers is scheduled for spring 2020 with Ted Berg, one of Canada's leading baritones, and the first ever encounter with instrumentalists, also planned for spring 2020, led by a surprising and a fairly well-known team of classical and jazz musicians. And finally, and you knew this was coming, we ask you to support these important programs by donating to IRCPA, as well as participating. We make it easy, just go to ircpa.net slash donate, one of four ways to give online, through the mail, through securities, and your aeroplan miles, so we can get beautiful people like this to come. So that's it, ircpa.net slash donate. This has been a conversation with Barbara Hannigan, brought to you by the International Resource Center for Performing Artists. Thank you all. Thank you, Barbara, and good night. <laughs>